Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vijay, and I work for eBay as uh, eBay's Observability Architect. So today, we're going to discuss about how we moved to Open Telemetry Collector, specifically, uh, and how we did it while we are running at the scale at which we are today. So we'll talk a little bit about what observability at eBay means, uh, what's our architecture, things that we use, and uh, what was the previous strategy that we used, how we evolved it over a period of time, um, some of the design changes that were associated with it, and then talk a little bit about the um, actual changes that were involved in the open telemetry migration and uh, talk about what we are going to do next. Uh, but before that, um, we are hiring uh, specifically to work on uh, Open Telemetry Collector. Uh, eBay is a great place to work. Uh, I've been here for 10 years, uh, and I consider it a blessing from God uh, to be able to work in such a great company. So if you are interested, uh, please use the QR code uh, to find out more. So observability at eBay. So what does a developer do? Uh, a developer first does some uh, instrumentation. Uh, to uh, They use either an open source library uh, that's bundled into the managed framework, or uh, if it's a drop-in application, if the application is pre-instrumented, then it's, uh, it's used. They onboard their uh, application into the observability platform by going into our uh, eBay's uh, Cloud Console and say, that this is the application that I need to onboard. If it's, a, if it's a metric onboarding, they say that my application exposes uh, port, say, 8080 slash Prometheus, and uh, uh, they basically hit submit, and then uh, a lot of magic happens uh, in the background where most of our scraping, log file tailing, and all that is part through annotations on top of Kubernetes. So all the annotations are delivered into the appropriate Kubernetes clusters so that uh, the actual harvesting can begin. So we have agents deployed on all our infrastructure, whether it be for logs, metrics, or traces. Uh, once the agent has enough information about what to look for, it goes and begins the harvesting process. So after harvesting is done, a user is free to set up uh, any alerts that they want to do, uh, want to be alerted on top of. So they can either use uh, uh, threshold place alerts in conventional PromQL style, or they can even do anomaly detection uh, using some of the models that we have built for the end user. Or if you have a TV screen on the hallway uh, that you want to uh, visualize or just on your laptop, you can build up dashboards using our console uh, so, so that you can observe what is going on. Scale. This is something that uh, I'm really passionate to talk about. Uh, when we were taking stock of how much we have grown, uh, we realized that uh, we are scraping about uh, 1.25 million uh, open metrics endpoint, uh, endpoints across uh, all our clusters. And that translates into roughly uh, 32 million uh, uh, time series per second that we are, or samples per second that we are scraping. And those translate to 1.5 billion active time series. Uh, we do 7,500 odd queries every, uh, every second. Uh, most of these translate into uh, recording rules, uh, either to roll up or to alert. Uh, very minimal dashboards. So a lot of it is actually being used by systems to power intelligence. And we provide a retention of one year for uh, all the raw metrics that are being collected on behalf of developers. So this roughly sums up the architecture that uh, we have for the Sherlock I.O. platform. Uh, on the leftmost side, you have actual applications that are being uh, deployed on our compute infra infrastructure. It can either be VMs or it can be uh, uh, Kubernetes nodes on which uh, the workloads are, are scheduled into. Uh, we have two major flavor of applications that are there. One is through managed applications. So we have managed frameworks for uh, Java, Node.js, uh, which, pre, which come prepackaged with some of the open source clients, or you can have a generic application that you're deploying. Uh, once it's deployed, uh, the agent that's either sitting on the same node or the same cluster, they start harvesting the data, 
it's sent into the platform, into our ingest APIs, and depending on what signal is being processed, you either have a, a metric store, event store, log store, or trace store. We store it in, and for a certain unique set of use cases, we have something called a probing engine, which is nothing but uh, stock Prometheus, which can either do SNMP walks or uh, use a SQL exporter to uh, query some metrics out of databases, and those also follow the same ingest path. We have a query layer which uh, implements uh, uh, the Prometheus API uh, for us to be able to uh, par either recording rules or anomaly detection or just simply view dashboards. So when it comes to uh, ingest and doing it in a, in a cloud native way, what does it actually mean? So for, 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 for us to be able to correct, collect metrics, we either need to be able to say that without knowing what the uh, application runtime is, we should be able to scrape it in a generic way, uh, regardless of what language you're using, or you should be able to push it in a well-defined format. So we have things like OTLP or Prometheus Remote Write, and we have open metrics endpoints that are there as well. But in some cases, it's not necessarily easy. You have uh, legacy applications for which you might need to have to do some sort of a one-off handling. But for the most part, uh, we, we would typically rely on some open source client, uh, and then we'll have some agents that are there which can understand some of these well-known protocols or handle these one-offs through custom plugins. Uh, and we also need to be able to discover them in, in specifically Kubernetes-like environments where things are very uh, ephemeral. So either you drop in an annotation uh, to say that this is where you need to look for, or if something is being sent, uh, given minimal information like a pod IP or a pod name and a namespace, you should be able to uh, enrich all the additional metadata that was, that, was, uh, uh, that was described as part of the pod spec itself. So in, in 2016, we initially started using the Elastic Beats family. Uh, uh, at that time, I think there was only uh, file beat and metric beat was just coming along. Uh, at that point in time, it, it, it looked really good to us. Uh, I think Prometheus was still a single server that, that, that queries uh, the entire cluster. And we were already at a stage where it was like we had several thousand nodes large number of Prometheus endpoints that were there, it was difficult for us to say that, okay, we can figure out the sharding and then set up multiple Prometheus clusters, uh, Prometheus instances. So for that reason, we, we went for the Beats route because uh, it was more deployable in the, in the daemon set pattern, so to speak, and uh, it was an agent just built uh, for being able to harvest inf uh, uh, observability information. So today we, uh, uh, we have, or at least until this point, we have used FileBeat for uh, collecting, uh, collecting logs, uh, metric beat. Uh, also, uh, initially it was deployed as a daemon set to be able to harvest metrics. Audit beat uh, deployed again as a daemon set to be able to collect uh, file integrity monitoring events and any audit rules that were added into the kernel to be able to uh, f figure out who is SSHing in or escalating to root and things like that. And finally, heartbeat for doing uh, uptime checks. So uh, a quick refresher for the daemon set pattern. Uh, a daemon set in Kubernetes basically allows you to deploy a single instance across all nodes that match the given uh, node selector. So uh, by default, it can go to every nodes, uh, all the nodes that are there, or you can even say that, okay, uh, I just need it on a particular set of nodes that uh, match a certain label selector. And what this agent uh, that is deployed into a given node will do is first it will communicate to the API server telling, uh, asking it, give me all the metadata for all the pods that were there in this, in this specific uh, Kubernetes node. Uh, and it will again say, okay, I, I will monitor these specific pods on these specific ports. Uh, once the data is collected, it will tag it with all the pod metadata and then ship it out. And uh, the daemon set pattern doesn't necessarily limit you to tagging only to pods. Uh, you can also say that, okay, along with the pod metadata, I need to tag some labels that are there in the namespace or certain labels that are there in the deployment object that the pod belongs to, so on and so forth. So for, for those kinds of metadata, you need to pull all the deployment objects or all the uh, namespace objects because those are not necessarily node scoped. So what is the problem with this, with this approach? 
the first biggest prob uh, problem is uh, resource fragmentation in the sense that every pod that you're deploying on every node for the process that is running in it, it has some arbitrary cost that is associated with it. So for example, if you say that it, it costs 50 MB to run the Beats pipeline or the hotel pipeline or whatever, then this means that if it's a 3,000 node cluster, it's going to cost you 150 gigabytes. So depending on how many Kubernetes nodes you're, you have across your uh, data centers or your public cloud, uh, you're going to spend that much on just running the process itself. And there's a CPU cost associated as well, uh, especially when it comes to pulling all the metadata from Kubernetes and then um, maintaining it over a period of time. The other problem, when you run as a daemon set, you, uh, you're going to say that, OK, I'm going to limit how much I'm going to spend on uh, metric scraping to, say, one CPU and one gigabyte for every node that you are deploying, uh, deploying into. So one GB. Well, while we say that Prometheus endpoints need to be uh, concise, the reality is that people tend to abuse instrumentation over a period of time. So uh, we have seen endpoints as small as tens or few hundreds, and endpoints as large as few millions worth of entries. A, a cube state metrics is a good example for that. So if you are giving one GB for um, metric beat that's that's running on a set uh, on, on on a node where cube state metrics is deployed as well it's going to crash and when it crashes you basically lose visibility into all the pods that are there on that kubernetes node as well and uh, given that you are watching the same artifacts f across all kubernetes nodes this is going to add uh, unnecessary api pressure on on uh, 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 unnecessary pressure because you're doing a lot of uh, redundant watches across all the nodes that are deployed on the cluster. So in order to mitigate some of these problems, we basically moved into a cluster local mode in the sense that rather than deploying as a daemon state, uh, daemon set, deploy it as a stateful set. Uh, uh, depending on the cluster size, you choose uh, for every uh, thousand nodes, I deploy 10 instances of metric beat or uh, open tail metric collector, whatever. Uh, and you basically shard the work across all, all of them. So uh, if you do a simple hash mod, you can use the stateful set size and then say that, OK, uh, this is the number. And if I am that instance ID, I basically monitor that pod, or I drop it, and then uh, 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 someone else will end up monitoring that. So this is how it would look. Uh, rather than being at the node, you sit at the cluster level. Uh, monitor only the pods that you are responsible for, and then send the data out once you have harvested it. So what were the advantages of this approach? Tremendous cost savings. So when we, when we did this, we saved 90% of capacity as compared to running it as a daemon set, specifically for metrics. And the amount of pressure that we put on the API server was substantially lower, uh, because rather than 3,000 nodes doing that, now it's say 10 or 20 or 30, depending on how big the cluster is. And given that we are running a finite number of pods, we can choose to run bigger uh, agents, um, say uh, 16 cores and 32 gigs, so, uh, uh, or depending on the cluster, do a different t-shirt sizing. But this meant that we could now process much bigger Prometheus endpoints without crashing. So this was one other big advantage that we saw. But somehow, this is still not enough. We are, we are never satisfied. So one of the problems that was there is that when you, when you end up doing a rollout uh, or a new version upgrade of the agent, uh, what's going to happen is that when one pod goes down, all the endpoints that were being monitored by that pod uh, suddenly black out. And if someone has said that, I need an alert on an absent query, uh, if uh, um, if the metric is absent for, say, one minute or two minutes, if it took two minutes for the pod to come up, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to fire. So this was problematic. And even though we were limiting the amount of API server watches that were there, um, it's still a lot of redundant API server watches. Uh, and sometimes what happens is that if a given cluster has several hundreds of th thousands of pods that are there, just being able to do this even with multiple workers on the, on the control loop, would still take several minutes for the entire thing to happen, which definitely means that someone is going to get alerted at the time of a rollout. 
and naive scheduling. Hash mod is still hash mod. It's not, it's not rocket science. So what we ended up doing is we thought, OK, maybe we should just decouple the discovery process from the, from the agent itself so that you have a centralized control loop that can, that can uh, do the discovery and let some workers know that this is what needs to be uh, handled by you. So that's, that's exactly what we did in the sense that we, we, we took the discovery process, put it in a separate control loop, uh, and we also started adding intelligence on top of it, uh, where uh, we, we also started looking at other parameters that are there, like CPU, memory. Uh, if a certain uh, metric beat agent is taking too much, time, uh, too much CPU resources, then maybe take a few endpoints from there and then put it into someone else so that the distribution is more complex than just hash mod. And uh, we also made the uh, configuration generation a lot more pluggable in the sense that you have a language uh, which you are using to define your uh, scrape logic uh, or the scrape rules. Now you can use that, parse it, and then generate a configuration for maybe metric beat or file beat or even open telemetry collector. So uh, when open telemetry uh, came about, it was very fascinating to us in the sense that similar to Kubernetes where you say that I have a pod. A pod is a pod regardless of it's running on a VM or it's running uh, on public cloud, private cloud. It's, it's, it's an API. Now the, uh, in the observability space, open telemetry brought the same notion in where you have, you have an API, you have an SDK, you also have a collector that you can use to do arbitrary transformations and then write to any backend, a backend that's either owned by eBay a vendor or an open source technology. This was a very powerful concept, and we were and at the time when the metric SDKs were becoming stable, we began to reevaluate to see that hey, maybe we should get on to this. We were already in the process of uh, uh, adopting tracing, um, moving metrics, and eventually logs. Made natural sense in that we would be in one family altogether. So that being said, so we have put in a lot of effort to say that okay. We are optimizing on cost. Uh, we are uh, uh, solving problems that make it easy for switching into uh, any agent. It should be very easy, right? But the, the journey wasn't as simple as that, in the sense that now all features that were available on MetricBeat, we needed some suitable alternative on open telemetry with the assumption that a certain feature was being used by at least one developer inside the company. Are there any showstoppers? We identified one big gap in the sense that Open Telemetry Collector does not allow us to do dynamic configuration reloading. This was one of the best features that we really liked about uh, uh, Elastic Beats that wasn't, wasn't there. Scrape parity. Does a scrape from metric beat look exactly the same as a, it would look on Open Telemetry Collector? Or for that matter, a scrape that's being done by Prometheus, would it look exactly the same uh, on Open Telemetry Collector? If it is not, is it a feature or, or, or is it by design or is it an actual bug? So these were some of the things that we, need to we needed to figure out. And the last one, Open Telemetry Collector is a rapidly evolving uh, community. Uh, there are so many releases that if we decide to move to a more recent version, how do we ensure that we are not regressing on any feature and causing issues at the time of rollout? So we came up with all the features that we needed and uh, what it would take for us to move to Open Telemetry Collector. Some of it was uh, already available, like metadata. You can use the attribute processor or the resource attribute processor. Auto discover we had figured out in the sense that we came up with our own color, uh, with our own control loop that can handle it. Uh, Prometheus scraping, there is an alternative. System metrics, there's an alternative. Kubernetes metadata, metadata enrichment, there's an alternative. And for everything else, we were like, okay, we can figure it out along the way in the sense that uh, if it's a feature that the community would accept, we would file pull requests and uh, get it into the community, or uh, we, can, we can manage it as a plugin internally. So to be able to address the, the problem of not being able to reload, uh, at least what we have done at this point is introduce an internal uh, receiver called the file uh, reload receiver, which can take the, uh, which can take a partial pipeline definition to say that this is the receiver 
and these are the processors that are associated with it. Um, it would plug in into a standard set of processors and an exporter. So this, what this would allow us is mimic the exact uh, reloading feature that Beats has and uh, bring the same capability into Open Telemetry Collector. So uh, what, was, what is essentially going to happen is that we would, uh, the receiver would watch all file changes that happen for uh, configurations that are being added and removed and it would stop those partial pipelines or start them. If, if there's a change, it would update it, so on and so forth. This file reload receiver, uh, we, have, we have been running it inside of eBay for a while now, and I think we are at a point where we are comfortable to start working with the community to see if that is something that can be accepted into the contrib repository. So this, at a high level, this is how it looks like. So if a person using the, the Beats hints-based auto-discover language defines that uh, I need to be able to scrape 5001 stats uh, and this is the namespace, the module, the uh, scrape frequency and scrape timeout. The left side is what the metric beat would generate and the right side is what we generate so that OTIL can understand. So as you can see, all the mappings that uh, we needed to make sure that the configuration is compatible across the agents uh, we are doing on the uh, uh, control loop. And we ran into a bunch of issues, especially with scrape parity, where uh, label sanitization, uh, sanitization, Prometheus was doing in one way, uh, Open Telemetry Collector was doing it in another way. And uh, uh, understanding colon as a, as a, as a star, for first character of a metric name, uh, Otel was behaving a different way than uh, Prometheus. So these are things that we have worked with the community and uh, we have filed PRs, they have been accepted by the community either behind a feature flag or as a straight out bug fix. And uh, uh, at least now we are in a, in a space where we can say that, okay, the scrapes more or less match and we can, start, we can confidently roll out uh, open telemetry into our, into our Kubernetes clusters. Um, we also had to put in a lot of effort to run um, um, uh, sort of pre-checks in the sense that uh, we spin up metric beat we spin up open telemetry collector, we point them to the same endpoint, uh, get, collect their outputs, compare the left side and the right side, make sure that things are good. And if they are good, then uh, uh, we move on to actually rolling out into the cluster. If we identify an issue, uh, we triage, fix, and then move forward. We kept iterating uh, and we, you'd be surprised how many times we had to roll back because as I had said, like 1.25 1 million Prometheus endpoints. There are going to be several quote unquote handwritings that people had in terms of how they did instrumentation. Some of it good, some of it not so good, but still we had to make sure that we do not break any um, uh, metric scraping when we are moving from one agent to another. So right now, uh, I think this, this happened just last week. Uh, we are done uh, migrating out of metric beat into uh, uh, open telemetry collector. We, uh, we even bridged uh, a gap of exemplars not being scraped by uh, the open telemetry collector. One of our engineers actually uh, filed a pull request that got merged a couple of weeks back. Uh, tracing, we are using uh, open telemetry collector uh, and the open telemetry SDK right from day one. Uh, and file beat also for logs, we are actively figuring out how uh, we can bridge the gaps and sometime next year, we'll be uh, fully on open telemetry collector for logs as well. Uh, we are still uh, hardening uh, by coming up with the regression frameworks that we can run periodically to make sure that we can upgrade with these. Uh, that is something that we are still actively working on. Uh, and uh, uh, over the coming uh, days, weeks, months, we will continue to work with the open telemetry uh, uh, collector community to make sure that uh, issues that we are seeing, uh, we are able to contribute fixes and we are also able to uh, work with the community to make sure that we are enhancing the capabilities that the, co the collector offers. Uh, this is our team, uh, Prem and Peter, they are the pillars of uh, the agent group, uh, did most of the migration for metrics. Uh, Aishwarya, she works on tracing, she helped with the exemplar feature, and then Edward, uh, he's uh, helping with the, the logs migration. If you like what you heard, scan the QR code, uh, we definitely would like to work with you on open telemetry together. <laughs>